That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Freud's Last Session, the third film directed by Matt Brown, which premiered at the 2023 AFI Film Festival. Sony Pictures Classics is releasing it uh, December 22nd, 2023. Uh, and like Madonna, we're going to analyze this. Ugh. Do I know Matt Brown's other films? No, I did see his previous 2015 film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, starring Dev Patel and Jeremy Irons, which was about an Indian mathematician, uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan. Uh, and I think I felt about the same for that film as I did this one. Well, this movie story sees Freud invite iconic author C.S. Lewis to debate the existence of God and his unique relationship with his daughter and Lewis's unconventional relationship with his best friend's mother. What's your pull quote? For a film about an imaginary conversation between two great minds of opposing thought, there's little of interest analyzed in this stuffy chamber piece which nourishes neither the mind nor the soul. Mine's kind of similar. For a film focusing on a subject known for his provocative and groundbreaking theories, Freud's last session feels surprisingly tame. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of shocked that we didn't... There are certain topics brought up, which we'll mention, that really just kind of go nowhere. It's all ego. I needed some id or super ego here. So the story, uh, it's set in London where Freud, Sigmund Freud's home is at this time. And it's the day after... Germany invaded Poland. Mm -hmm. So we see that Sigmund Freud's at home. He's in a lot of pain because he's suffering from oral cancer. Um, he's, th th there is no surgery. They can't operate it on it. So he's just being, uh, he's getting palliative care. He's like hopped up on morphine all the time. So we see he lives with his daughter. Mm -hmm. Sigmund Freud's played by Anthony Hopkins. Yes. And his daughter's played by... Liv Lisa Fries uh, from Babylon, Berlin. They have a very codependent uh, relationship, and he expects her to cater to all of his needs. But she also is, like, a lecturer. So on this day, like, Germany has invaded Poland. Alarms are going off in London. Churchill has given Hitler, famously, an ultimatum to withdraw, and life is in chaos. This lady decides to go to work. Mm -hmm. And then we see that C.S. Lewis is on his way to go see Freud. Mm -hmm. And we find out that Freud wrote C.S. Lewis, basically inviting him for a conversation. So for some reason, they all decide to do this thing today. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis is played by Matthew Good. Right. And notably, Anthony Hopkins played C.S. Lewis in the film Shadowlands in 1993. And I know Matthew Good from that movie we reviewed. Matchpoint. Matchpoint. He's also in a, he's in a ton of stuff. He's in a really bad remake of Bride's Head Revisited. But the bulk of the movie is these two people, one a staunch atheist and the other a devout Christian, sort of like very lightly criticizing each other's beliefs, but then also being kind of intrigued by one another. Mm -hmm. And while this is happening, Freud has run out of morphine. He's fiending, like legit fiending, calling his daughter, you need to do something. At one point, they have to evacuate because of a raid. A potential air raid. A, a, a potential air raid. So Freud and Lewis go to like a church basement. They come back to the house. So they spend quite a bit of time together. Lewis, Lewis, Lewis is triggered. He's triggered, which we can talk about. The, the daughter actually ends up talking to Lewis saying, like, I'm on my way with medicine. You know, sorry, I can't be there. He agrees to stay for some reason, even though he can't help in any way. Uh, and then finally, when the pain is too much for Freud, because he mentions more than once that the only person who can tend to his prosthetics, because he's wearing basically like an elaborate, well, kind of, kind of like dentures, basically, that only his daughter can, he allows to clean them. He won't even take them out himself. So he tells Lewis to help him because he's in pain, although Freud is the one who ultimately takes them out. And then Lewis says, okay, well, I guess I can go now. And as he's leaving, the daughter shows up. Another plot point is the daughter is a lesbian. Uh-huh. And we see there's a bit of conversation how Freud doesn't really want to accept his daughter as a lesbian and certainly doesn't want to accept her girlfriend. Dorothy, played by Jody Balfour. So in the end, as Lewis is leaving, the daughter shows up and says, thanks for holding down the fort um, so you can go on and go. But then he kind of lingers and sees the girlfriend pull up mm -hmm. and then they kind of have a moment where they say, like, I'm ready to go in the house. So Lewis is seeing that. 
lesbians are real. The end. And Sigmund Freud will die another day. <laughs> Madonna. <laughs> uh, I, okay. I'd be lying if I didn't say, or if I said that I thought, that they, I didn't think this was kind of boring. <laughs> It was very dull, uh, and, and I don't know, made C.S. Lewis, I think, seem kind of like a rube, because uh, it opens with a quote by uh, John Bunyan from Pilgrim's Progress, because C.S. Lewis had just written a uh, satire, Pilgrim's Regress, I, 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 I believe is the title, uh, and so there's some sparring over that. But this needed to be at the level of Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, where Max von Sydow was talking to death and playing chess. <laughs> Yes, it, it, it just needed to have, because when I think about Freud, I think about the id and the ego, and I think about psychosexual analysis. The Oedipal complex. All of that. And this movie is like, it kind of grazes those areas, but then it just, there's even a point where Freud's trying to talk to C.S. Lewis about his own sex life, and he's like, and Lewis says, I'm not talking about that. And then that's the, that's it. That's it. Like, okay, well, why are we here then? Why am I watching this imaginary interaction? Well, and it, apparently this is spurred because in some notes or appointment book at, at about this place in time, uh, Freud had invited an Oxford Don over and it was speculated that it might have been C.S. Lewis. Uh, you said this is based on a play? Yes, by Mark St. Germain, who I believe adapted the play for the screen. As we were watching it, I was thinking I would prefer this as a play where we just had these two gentlemen in a room having these very sort of, uh, you know, philosophical conversations. They get heated. Maybe if, if it's a theater production, like at a house, like a theater house for a period of time, maybe every night's like, the, the, you know, it's not 100% scripted. Like these two actors are kind of evolving their conversations. I, I could see that being very interesting, but in this, we get a lot of flashbacks to uh, their childhoods. Their childhoods and experiences that sort of informed the adults they are today, which I felt a lot of times will say, like, oh, they should show, not tell. But in this instance, I feel like you could have just told us. Like, we, we didn't need to see that Freud's dad was a staunch atheist and told him never be religious. <laughs> and we didn't need to, you know, like, you could have just told us, like, oh, your sister and the grandchild died and so that really made you lose your faith in god and then for c.s lewis we see he was in the war watch people die and then how he converted to christianity which isn't i think uh, explained in a way that makes any real sense i agree i think what would have been more interesting is these two people who have very similar experiences related to trauma and grief how one abandon a certain dogma and the other one clings to it mm -hmm. and, and how that works and we don't really do that and freud very much is his older daughter sophia uh who was killed i forget what disease and her small child and oh he, that's right the child died from tuberculosis yes, and she yes. died from like scarlet fever something so, like scarlet that envy. but <laughs> that that came across in a way that's similar to like the mel gibson character losing his faith in m night Shyamalan signs Sure. And then Hopkins, who I Hopkins is the reason to see this film. Yes. I think he's I think he's entertaining, and I've sided a lot more with his worldview. Uh, but his little uh, glasses were giving me the road to Wellville. Or he looked like that character from Arthur. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is it Arthur? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I thought he was cute. His accent went in and out, mm -hmm. um, but he has little quirks. Like he, his character says "yep, yeah, yeah" a lot, which I thought was cute. Uh, this being released at this time reminds me of about over a decade ago when The Last Station came out, I think also in December, with Christopher Plummer and Helen Mirren as Tolstoy and his wife. Mm. I think I like that film better, but this feels very much on that kind of wavelength. I only have a few notes. Uh, the way Ford is played in this movie, I thought he was... I could, he was... I liked Anthony Hopkins as this character, but... I kept thinking he's annoying, and I don't know why C.S. Lewis is even tolerating him. Like all day long, all uh, day long. Like I, I don't care if I gotta wait because all the kids are going to the countryside. I'm getting on one of those trains. But it's about you know C.S. Lewis, of course, was good friends with Tolkien, who is referenced here, mm -hmm. and apparently, from what I recall, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote his novel *Mere Christianity* out of his conversations and relationship with Tolkien. One of the flashbacks we get is the reason Freud ended up in London is because while they were in Austria, 
the no. well it was not occupied by nazis yeah uh, they uh the nazis came to freud's wherever he was and they wanted him and the daughter says no let them take me and they did so they did but then of course she, the lesbian daughter she uh was not dispatched but we see that freud gives his daughter i don't know if that was like a cyanide, yeah, a cyanide capsule mm -hmm. and then like so in case things go left she can and he has one as well and then we also see that he has one and i i thought that was interesting because we also find out that he and his doctor dr sure i think it is uh freud's doctor they have already come up with like an advanced directive which is when i get real bad you need to give me enough morphine to kill me. Yeah, they're going to euthanize me. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was interesting that we see him fiddling with his cyanide capsule, but also he says, like, we have this plan. We hear him talking to his doctor. Um, I felt like some things they beat over the head. Yes. The, a few things. Like the morphine. Mm -hmm. It just is like, he seems like a full-on crackhead, the way he's acting about this. Well, it's just, I know he's in pain and it's end of, you know... He, call, he calls his daughter at the university while she's in the middle of a lecture and of course she has to drop everything and that's where some her boss basically tells her she has uh, an attachment, a, issues. attachment issues and she's like thanks for the analysis and then he proceeds to run down like how many lectures she's missed recently because of her father's right. illness and it's like but also it is her father and he's dying so this is a pretty human thing that you'd have to take care of the elder uh, and also uh, Germany invaded Poland and everything's about to be shut down so maybe right. it's okay if classes are let out early today. Right. Yeah, I just feel like we focused on the wrong things for this fictional scenario. Like, I wanted to see the daughter and Freud have it out. I just don't think for the extended state of delay for Lewis to not leave this home. Uh, and, and they're also interrupted by a visit from Jeremy Northam playing, uh, who I believe is also a professor that has uh, romantic interests in Anna and has kind of a shouting match with Anthony Hopkins. I wrote down a quote. Do you remember this? If pleasure is his whisper, pain is his megaphone. Hey, they're talking about God. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> um, sure. We also find out that... I, I think another good premise for a movie like this, we find out that Freud was his daughter's psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. And then when she started talking about her sex dreams, he... Lost his mind. We also find out that she went to like what sounded like conversion therapy. Uh, I, I, because something was, like they that. hint at something insidious, but it, she also had an eating disorder. Wouldn't that have been interesting to talk about how her dad was her therapist and end up sending her to this conversion therapy type thing? And because we also hear Freud tell Lewis that homosexuality is okay, but lesbian, lesbianism is not because lesbianism stems from like. A paternal defect or something and then that's it mm -hmm. but like most of the entire plot line related to the daughter is about her lesbianism uh -huh. so i feel like we needed more understanding of why he rejects her and it's i think anna freud is a very interesting yeah. person uh both professionally because she was uh at the forefront of child psychoanalysis uh Again, you know, thanks to how she was probably reared by her father. Uh, but also, she never publicly acknowledged her sexuality, even though Dorothy, I believe, was her partner throughout her life. And in fact, in her professional career, came out quite hard against homosexuality. That's interesting. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack there yeah. with someone like her. I would have rather had this about conversations between Freud and his daughter. Yeah. Uh, my final note is when Freud is talking to Lewis, he's he's like, well, let, let, let's just feel good in the fact that if you're right about God and all the things, then everyone will know, right? Because y'all will be up in heaven shaking hands and high-fiving. But he says, if I'm right, no one will ever know because mm -hmm. there's nothing. I, I liked that quote from him. But yeah, overall, I was just kind of like, <sighs> this could have been so much more provocative. And yeah. For, for a figure who's known... And push boundaries and then with why have this religious figure c.s lewis here and it feels so like you know what it felt this movie felt like when you have two neighbors who have very different views but they kind of get along and it's like you know i have a problem with gay people but i'll wave at your gay kid and because we're neighbors and we're cordial this all just felt very cordial even the fact that like world war ii is like <laughs> 
it just all feels like inconsequential to what's happening. I, I, I just, I don't know. For some, and then in the end credits tells us like, oh, because C.S. Lewis opened his home to vagabond children from the war, that's how he got the ins the inspo for the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's like all oh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. What, I mean. How much do we care about him? Because the film doesn't seem like it does as a person. That's right. Yeah, actually. What would you give Freud's last session? I would give it two out of five. It was okay to me. I would say two and a half out of five. Anything else? I'm going to wake up yes and no. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>